I thought today I'd skip ahead to the commentary of passage number two, a test of faith, burn your son. It's a story that comes to us from Genesis 22, and one you're all likely familiar with, the story of Abraham and Isaac. Abraham, the grand patriarch, the father of three faiths, the man, the myth, the legend, a man set in motion by the activation of a unique set of traits, those that would find their way through the crippled helix of moral depravity and colonize the molecular fabric of his third great-grandson, Moses. Both would be equally encoded with an attuned ear for hearing voices, especially those of the divine, and a readiness to execute their wishes on command. Today we call this schizophrenia. Nevertheless, we are much obliged for the many clinical mental disorders that plagued this family lineage of fictional characters, those of which inspired countless stories such as this within our passage. Stories that give us invaluable insight into the true moral nature of the God of the Bible. Building up to this massively iconic story, there's a key feature in Abraham's meteoric rise to superstardom that conveniently remains unmentioned among those who uphold the and teach the sacrality of this test of Abraham's faith found in Genesis 22. Beginning with Genesis 12 and through chapter 17, we find a staggering 18 instances where God himself promises Abraham fame, glory, land, and descendants like that of the stars. God's fatiguing redundancy overemphasizes the fact that the deal is sealed. Heck, Abraham even whacked the top wing of his wanger to secure the agreement at the command of God. We arrive at chapter 22, and the voices in Abraham's head return with an additional stipulation. Hey man, it's me again, God. You're doing good, bud. But, um, yeah. There's just one more thing I'm going to need from you to seal the deal. So, I'm going to need you to go ahead and burn your son. You know, to me, as a sacrifice. Abraham obeys, and this obedience, exegetically speaking, is one of the defining moments that has created a fathomless chasm in dividing the faithful from the infidel, or any thinking agent. It's simply incomprehensible in finding these faithful adherents, many even being family and friends, deriving lessons out of this disastrous debris of delusion, concocted from a clinically twisted mind. I question every ounce of their very nature, and especially their morality, the supposed morality that comes from God. Like little mentally debilitated minions, they rush to their safe haven at the end of the story, where Abraham is relieved of this duty in an attempt to intellectualize their sad and obvious miniature stature of a human being. Of course, what follows as the gotcha hammerfall is the cliché parallel of, and see, God went all the way in killing his son. Though quite embarrassingly, in revering just this one story, their mental framework is overtly displayed as one that is stripped of the beauty of true love and empathy, and warped into believing an infinitely flawed logical fallacy. It's in the Bible, so it's okay. Or, the Bible says so. Simply put, the Bible and any holy book, especially those containing the purported words of God, should contain nothing that we as humans would be unwilling to do and should make no requests that would violate our moral nature. Yes, the very moral nature that naturally defies the moral nature of God. Thanks, everybody. Blessings to you. Go in peace. See ya.